Hello everyone, I am Dr. Maria Spinola and I am a clinical psychologist. In this channel, I share free wellness tips in English and Spanish. So make sure you subscribe, leave your comments and share this video with others who might need it. Today's topic is how to ace an interview. And my guest is Dr. Kip Thompson. We are going to share eight tips. The first six tips can be used by anybody who is looking to interview soon. That means anybody who needs to interview to get a job, an internship, an externship, a postdoc, or people who need to complete an admission interview for a doctoral program. The last two tips are more specific for people who want to pursue a career in psychology or counseling. As I mentioned, my guest today is Dr. Kip Thompson. So now I'm going to let him introduce himself. Uh, first, Dr. Espinola, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, speak with you today and have this opportunity. Um, my name is Dr. Kip Thompson, and I am currently clinical coordinator and assistant professor of counseling psychology at Fordham University at Lincoln Center. So in that capacity, I teach graduate level courses that include both masters and doctoral students. I help to coordinate the clinical training for the doctoral students and provide general administrative support for the faculty at uh, Lincoln Center at Fordham University. Well, thank you, Dr. Thompson, for being here today. I'm really excited. I think this video is going to be helpful to a lot of people who are looking to interview soon. So the first tip that we wanted to share with everybody was improve your mental fitness through self-care. So Dr. Thompson, what do you personally use regarding self-care to be ready for an interview? Um, exercise, um, getting sunlight, particularly in the pandemic is really important, you know, getting fresh air as often as you can. Um, you know, I think that, you know, people tend to feel more confident when their, uh, their hair and, you know, uh, makeup, if they use it is on point. So going to get like a haircut right beforehand or, you know, getting your hair done or getting your nails done. These are small tips that, you know, can really make the difference when you're walking into a situation where you don't know anybody and you want to make a good impression. Um, you know, getting a solid eight hours of sleep, um, you know, having a balanced diet that includes, you know, um, fresh vegetables, fresh proteins, um, fruits, drinking lots of water, small things like that really make the difference in making sure that you put forth your uh, most positive impression when you're meeting with people who you don't know. Yeah, I think I, this is something that I always recommend to people. And one is exercise. So the pandemic has prevented a lot of people from accessing fitness centers, but there are a lot of videos that you can use on YouTube that can help you with that. I sometimes recommend people if they don't have any physical problems, maybe mm -hmm. to, wear, to use some um, jumping rope or you know do some weights in the morning or yeah some cardio inside the home if you cannot go anywhere but that can like energize you and um research has shown that 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 puts you at a different energy level so um, it can be really helpful before an interview and in terms of diet I definitely recommend brain food which includes salmon and blueberries so um, definitely to keep that in mind. In terms of sleep, it's easy to say, like get eight hours, right? But sometimes if you have a lot of anxiety associated with the interview, that can prevent you from falling asleep at night. So you definitely want to take care of that. I do have a video where I teach a specific skills uh, to get you there. Um, anything else regarding self-care? I think that being mindful about the people and influences you keep around yourself leading up to the interview. You know, if you know that certain friends or family members or colleagues are more anxious than you, or they tend to, you know, play devil's advocate or otherwise have attitudes that are not necessarily helpful for the energy that you're trying to, to keep and hold, I think that um, keeping a, a distance from them leading up to the interview, even if it's just temporary, can be helpful because you don't want, you know, other people's 
energy and thoughts influencing and impacting like what you say during the interview? That's a really good tip. Yeah, I definitely have seen people getting negatively impacted by those around them. Sometimes they can be family members, sometimes they can be close friends. And many times it's not that they are doing it in purpose, it's their own anxiety and they're mm -hmm. just talking, <laughs> trying to be helpful, but they are really unhelpful by mm -hmm. <laughs> the tension and the stress. So yeah, it, it is a good idea to keep some distance. Uh, from people that where you if you be, if you remember feeling a stress around them just like keep a distance from them uh during a, as you get into the pre-interview period so tip number two is take control of your thoughts don't reject yourself basically mm -hmm. so people do that a lot for multiple reasons sometimes it's their own anxiety or their own experiences of discrimination racism so we want to discuss that a little bit. Um, so what can you tell us about that, Dr. Thompson? Um, I think that positive self-statements are really important leading up to interviews. Um, I have worked hard for this. I am ready for this. You know, um, I have the skill set for this. Um, you know, reminding yourself why you have made the choice to be in this field, reminding yourself why you are good at it, for lack of a better word, um, reminding yourself that about those times in your life where other people have acknowledged that you're good at it, whether your mentors have, you know, uh, identified you as having a skill set, or you got an A in a paper, or you did a really good presentation. I think that um, kind of uh, not only reminding yourself, but really immersing yourself in all of the positive things that you've done in your work to that brings you to this point can be really helpful. And sometimes when I'm right before I'm going to have an interview, especially if I'm anxious about it, I might review my own resume or CV, you know, just to kind of get a reminder of all the, you know, the mountains that I've already climbed. Because I think that it's really easy to get caught in a cycle of thinking that you're not good enough for something, if, especially if you're competing or interviewing for something that many people want, you know. And um, I think that being careful about not um, giving in to those thoughts that would make you think that you're less than is really important. Absolutely, I agree. And, and I also have a video that I did with Dr. Montgomery. I don't know if you saw it, but it was just how to deal with imposter syndrome. Ooh. So that's a, that's a good one that I'm going to add. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is to deal with like any thought associated with like, I'm not good enough, others mm -hmm. are better than me, I'm less done, you're consistently negatively comparing yourself to others. So mm -hmm. imposter syndrome is incredibly common, especially even more common among top places, among really, really smart people. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to take care of that for sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I would be really excited to see that video too. I don't think I've seen it yet with Dr. Montgomery, but that I think is a resource that people need um, because it doesn't matter what level of education you have. People with doctorates, master's degrees, you know, I'm sure medical degrees as well, all experience this. It, it doesn't go away unless you're mindful about preventing it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually she mentions the same thing that you said, but, uh, she said, like, you, I remind myself of the things that I have already accomplished. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad she and I agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> I probably could learn a lot from her. <laughs> okay. Tip number three is a stay focused, which can be really hard if you have a lot of anxiety and you feel stressed. So what are some techniques that you use, Dr. Thompson, to stay focused while you are doing an interview? Sure. When I was in high school, I was enrolled in our uh, journalism class, which was 
part of the student newspaper. And I remember one of the teacher, the, the teacher of that class told me to imagine that the person you're talking to and you're interviewing has a triangle on their face where the forehead is the straight line and it converges at the bottom of their mouth. And so as long as you keep your eyes inside of that triangle where you're looking either at their eyes, their nose, or their mouth at all times, um, they, it'll always appear as if you are looking directly at their eyes, right? I know that when I'm interviewing with people, sometimes it's hard for me to keep my focus on them. You know, I, my eyes tend to jump all over the room. We'll go to their desk, we'll go to the wall, we'll go to the window. Um, and sometimes that's okay. But when you are interviewing, it's really important that you show that you are interested in what they have to say. And so if you can remember and imagine that triangle where all of your focus stays inside of the triangle, eyes, nose, or mouth, at least when you're answering their questions. Um, if, you know, um, or if they're directly making contact with you. If you're making small talk, you know, it, you know, it's, it's not as rigid, it's not as important, I think, but when we're in the, the meat of the interview, I think it's really important to, um, to narrow your focus to those places. That's a great tip. Yeah, one thing that I recommend to you is to use grounding skills while mm -hmm. you are in the interview. I have done it myself. Basically what I do, and I do have a video that I talk about all different grounding skills. I think the ones that I generally use for the interview will be the ones at the end where I cover the grounding kit. So um, one of the things that I found helpful was to use like little antibacterials from Bath and Body Works or other ones, but that they have a nice smell mm -hmm. or hand lotions, like tiny hand lotions that I keep in my purse. And then, you know, in different moments, I just put that in, you know, I use it. And while I'm using it, I'm focusing on that. But right? mm -hmm. so I use the specific products that have a nice aroma to them. Yeah. So that's what kind of like it helps me ground myself with my senses. Yeah. So I found that really calming just to clear up my mind right before an interview. Um, another thing that I found really helpful, and this is for interviews and meetings that may be stressful too is to have a glass of water near you, mm -hmm. cold water. So just like touching the cold glass can be grounding for me personally. And then it's just like taking a sip to calm down and relax and focus on. And, and so I'm also taking my time, by right? Like just I'm adding more time to calm down and clear out my mind. I find that really helpful. Yeah, Marsha Linehan will be really proud of you with the, with the uh, <laughs> self-soothing. Uh, and this, and I'm like, as soon as you said it, I'm like, that is so DVT, it's not even funny. I love it. Um, it makes me wonder though, for those of us who, and I'm not, and I hate to say it like this, but for many men who don't necessarily use a lot of lotions or like scents, how do you think we can use that without, while still, is it possible to use a tip like that while still staying in our comfort zone? Like. Would you say that we should get like colognes or like, you know, um, masculine, quote unquote, smelling <laughs> scents? Like how, like how, because I, I would want to do that, but like I'm not the kind of person that's going to pull out, you know, uh, the sun ripened raspberry, just like, you know, out of nowhere. How do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think for men, because we are in a pandemic, mm -hmm. it's actually a good idea to get into material with you anyway. So just the Chanel one, it doesn't have to be the, the lemon scent one. Right. Um, but I think that that would be okay. Okay. Uh, also, like if people are not looking, so if it's just like privately, especially mm -hmm. now that people are doing the interviews at home uh, mm -hmm. through Skype or uh, through Zoom and stuff, um, you can do that outside of the view of the person. So prior to the interview, that's a good that's idea. True. And then the, the cold glass of water, that goes for everybody. Everywhere. I'm so glad you said that because I do that, but it wasn't something that I figured out until I would say by the time we got to internship, at that point at moving forward, then I started always having a glass of water, but there's nothing worse than being in an interview. Someone asks you something and then your throat closes up. And, you know, and then there's like a moment where you're struggling for words because you're struggling, you know, not to breathe per se, but you, you need that, um, uh, 
that, that lubrication really to help you kind of move forward. And so I've been using that a lot. And especially when people ask me questions and I don't know the answer, taking a glass from that cold water or sip from that cold water can really give you time to figure out how you're going to address it. Absolutely. Yes, it's a mm -hmm. great way to get some time before answering. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing, because it's getting really cold, it, so tea can be another option. So hot tea. In that, it, you can get a teas with different aromas that are very pleasant. So mm -hmm. I use one that is called positive energy. <laughs> they have like citric smell. They can mm -hmm. like wake you up a little. It's really cool. So I definitely recommend people to try on different things like that with some honey. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I'm a fan of um, mint teas, like mm -hmm. peppermint tea and spearmint tea for the same reasons. Yeah. I really like some of the other suggestions you had for tip number three, um, yeah. you know, sh us showing that we're listening, spacing out the interviews if possible. Um, yeah. I think that's really important um, because, you know, you want to have time to decompress and process what happened in the interview, you know, pick and choose what things worked, what things didn't work so well, maybe writing them down and, you know, talking with the positive minded people around you to get a sense of what the interview sounded like to them so that you can go into the next interview even more prepared. If you have interviews scheduled back to back, you might not have that time to process and decompress. So I think that spacing them out is a really good one. Yeah, I find a spacing out interviews a very helpful technique because it allows me to just focus on that side and that's it. Nothing else is in my mind other than that side. So right. if you can space at least, so the rec my recommendation is just to wait another at least two days mm -hmm. uh, before you move on to the other interview. Just because like you're supposed to be super focused on this and put a lot of energy, um, and work on figuring out everything like no, well, we're going to be talking about later regarding the match and what the site is and who works mm -hmm. and all of that. So um, you don't want those uh, type of contents from one interview to <laughs> mix into mm -hmm. another one. So you definitely want to have a clear mind before you move on to the next, to the next interview. The energy level during the interview is fundamental, I think. You really, really want to show that you have enthusiasm about mm, the interview, that you care, that you are excited to be there. So you show that in different ways. I mean, definitely looking awake. <laughs> so mm -hmm. personally, I found that using a little makeup can help me look awake, like a little moisturizing, working out in the morning, um, for the the interviews online, it is helpful to have a good light. A lot of yes. people use ring lights that you can get on Amazon. I can put a link there. Um, but basically, any light that you know fits you well, that can bright up the environment, that can bright up your face, and then obviously sleeping well and you know doing all the self care techniques that, I, where, that we mentioned before. And generally, just demonstrating enthusiasm by showing that you know enough about the site. Mm. You also want to show that you're listening. So you may want to use some validation techniques. So just making sure that you're responding appropriately to what is being asked of you, mm -hmm. that you follow up on. So you can say, oh, I heard you mention that, you know, doing the, sometimes people give you a little bit of an overview of the site. So you mm -hmm. can follow up on some of the things that were mentioned in that overview. Absolutely. It's also definitely a really good idea to um, uh, mention something that you have already read about the site so that you may have found online or you may have heard from other people. So mentioning that it can be really helpful and show that you're very focused on that specific site. Absolutely. I want to add to that as well. I think that nonverbal communication is sometimes helpful um, to let them know that you're listening and that you're paying attention. So if they say, if the interviewer says something that is, you know, somewhat unexpected, allowing your eyebrows to jump a little bit 
not being exaggerated about it, but, you know, letting them know, wow, you know, or if they, you know, make a small joke, smiling at it, you know, or maybe chuckling because it lets them know that not only are you listening, but you're tuned in and that your emotional wavelengths are matching right now in the moment. And I think that with a lot of interviews I've had that went really well, I was able to like find the frequency of the interviewer and stay in that zone for as long as I could, where if they said something that was, you know, if they, if they said something that was funny, I laughed. If they said something that was um, surprising, I exclaimed. If they said something that was, you know, maybe sad, you know, I, I expressed sorrow to some extent. Again, not overwhelming, making the needle jump, but just so that we, you know, we're in the zone together and they know that if they chose me, you know, I'll be able to find their frequency and stay in it. And I think that particularly supervisors are looking for somebody who can do that because it means that they can communicate more with less. Exactly. Yeah. So in reference to body language, there is a video that I recommend. It's a TED talk. Okay. It's one, I think it's one of the most popular TED talks ever, but it talks about power posters. And a lot of research has been done on that. Some research saying that they are not as effective as they were claimed to be in that video. But there is like definitely some research saying that people tend to feel more confident after, after doing power poses. So that has been cons consistent and I will, I'll do them and I definitely recommend them. So yeah, I will, I will definitely recommend people to check out that video. I think it's excellent and you can practice some power poses, you know, since I would say like 10 minutes before the interview is appropriate. I can't help but smile when I hear you say that, Dr. Espinola, because I remember you teaching us about power poses in Boston during internship. And I remember the poses that you showed us. <laughs> and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be inappropriate right now and try to strike one for the camera, but I just never forget you doing one at that table and the rest of us being like, well, maybe I should try that. <laughs> So I'm glad to hear that that's still that's something that you uh, promote and, you know, you use as part of your repertoire and what you teach to others, because it, it does it does make a difference. You know, and we talk about um, earlier some of the tips about, you know, warding off imposter syndrome and you know warding off thoughts and keeping energy. And these are things that you can do with your body uh, to to make some of those some of those changes more concrete. So, I, I mean, it's it's. Good branding, good branding, Dr. Espinola. That's, that's all I can say. <laughs> and then the other one is uh, the posture. So mm -hmm. she talked about it in the video too, just keeping a good posture. So because mm -hmm. that that really makes a difference if you're like making yourself a small mm -hmm. uh, or you're shaking a lot. Or, so that that is not going to be helpful, right? So yeah, take a look at that video. <laughs> it's true. Yes, please, please do drop it for us. Absolutely. <laughs> So very common experience for people who are interviewing is to um, get distracted by their, by their own thoughts. So they start, so they're in the interview, but they're thinking like, how is this going? Like, I don't think they like me or uh, what should I say next? Very common. So don't do that. And if you find yourself doing that, just make sure that you bring your attention back to where it's supposed to be which is you in the room with the interviewer. And then there's, I heard a lot of people say now that many interviews are being done as group interviews. Mm -hmm. So you not only have to pay attention to the interviewer, but also to your peers who are interviewing with you. So mm -hmm. if something is being asked, for instance, make sure you pay attention to what other people are, listening, are saying, because mm -hmm. you can, it's helpful to say, that is a great response. I would like to build on that, right? So you make sure that you don't uh, put down other people. Right. So make sure you do that. Uh, do not repeat what other people say. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so generally it's a good idea. If you agree with some of what another person say, you can acknowledge that and move on to build on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And if, and if you hear something from somebody that you don't necessarily agree with, not turning it into an opportunity for debate, 
you know um you can acknowledge that it's not something that you've heard about before and then you know switch gears and say well another way of looking at it could be this or i've never heard of it put like that before my approach to it is more like this um you know because i i think that acknowledging differences is fine but being respectful and and showing um not not just respect but dignity to everyone involved i think is really important and and keeps a, a conversation fresh it doesn't necessarily mean you should do that but if you, if you're going to making sure that you're respectful about showing those differences without turning it into anything that can be contrived as like a debate or an argument because that, this is an interview is not the place for that mm -hmm. exactly okay so tip number four is to get the look, <laughs> the ideal look for the interview. Mm -hmm. So generally, I think, well, we, we talk about lighting. So lighting is really important if you're doing interviews from home. Mm -hmm. And then whether you're interviewing from home or in person, just make sure that what you're wearing is appropriate, is uh, professional. Um, I think generally it's safer to go with like some classic look. Mm -hmm. So personally, I found that wearing her earrings, um, just general like classic makeup, nothing exaggerated, um, mm -hmm. non using like very bright colors. So just general colors like a dark blue, um, a white shirt under, clean press. So mm -hmm. all those type of things can, um, show that you prepare, that you are put together, that you you were thoughtful about, you know, how you were going to look that day. I don't know if you have other other thoughts about that. Absolutely. Um, and I, uh, I agree with everything that you just said. And I would add to it that um, since the pandemic started, obviously a lot of training opportunities have had to move online for the interviewing and some of the professionals who I've spoken to and listened to about interviewing in a pandemic really strongly encourage people to be mindful about the background that they have while they're interviewing, not having any political content um, behind them, not having any um, any distracting posters or you know uh, colors or anything behind them that would take away from the focus which should be on them while they're speaking. Um, not having any animals in the room, right? You know, locking your your door, your dog or your cat or anything that moves in another room so that you don't get distracted. Because it's, I mean, we all, you know, people have children, people have pets, people have partners, but you wanna make sure that there's never a point during this interview where you lose the focus or that you lose distraction because you're trying to, you know, handle this. A lot of, well, a lot of, most of my students are in New York City. If you've been in New York City ever in your life, you know that a fire truck or a police car can, you know, come down the street any second. So what you're going to try to do, if possible, is, um, you know, use sound machines or interview in a room where there are no windows. If you, you know, if it doesn't hurt with lighting to prevent that because there's nothing we can do we can't stop these vehicles or you know the the sounds of new york city but what you want to try to do is make sure that you minimize that as much as you can um you know and you know do the best you can to uh be in places where that's less likely to happen if it's not going to impact other factors so tip number five is mm -hmm. to sell the match Mm -hmm. Show that you're a fit for the team, the department, the company that you're applying to work for. Mm -hmm. So what can you tell us about that? Dr. Espinola, there's, I mean, I would say arguably this is probably one of the most important parts of the interview that we have discussed so far. There's so many things, you, you know, before the interview, you need to prepare. You need to make sure that, you know, what this place is offering, how they do it, if it's a psychology place, what kind of populations they work with, what are their approaches to it, is this more of a CBT place, is this a psychodynamic place, if it's a psychology thing. Um, 
getting to know who are the supervisors and faculty members there. And if, this, if it's not a psychology place, what do they do? Like, who are the people? There's always a list of people on their website that are important names that you should know. So um, getting to know uh, that information can be really helpful. And also taking inventory of what you bring to the table, you know, and there is a reason why you applied, but then there's a even better reason why they interview, they uh, invited you for an interview. If they invited you for an interview, then that means that they can see what you could bring to the table. So you need to take an inventory of what that is. Even if you haven't necessarily had uh, clinical cases yet, do you write well? Do your, are your letters recommendation strong? Have you had classes that are interesting and that push you outside your comfort zone? Think about all of the assets and the strengths that you have and how you can um, humbly, cleverly bring those up in the middle of an interview so that you're reminding them of what you could bring to the table and that you're valuable and, and could be a, a really a, you know, a good addition to their team. Um, you want to um, think about how this particular place, whether it be a training site or a job or whatnot, can enhance your skill sets. You know, if you are looking for a place that will teach you how to do assessment, what types of tests does this place have and how does that fit into your goals? Do they have a rotation or do they work with a population you've been wanting to work with for a while? How do you bring that up in conversation? How do you make it sound like, um, I recognize I don't have this experience set, but I recognize that you all have to offer it. And I'm confident that you're gonna be able to help me connect the dots based on the research that I've done about this place. These are the things I think that are really helpful. Um, if there are particular people that you're interested in working with that already are there, identifying them, um, and not being weird about it, but just mentioning, I saw this person's uh, information on your company website. They seem really cool. They seem exciting. I know that they could take me in directions that I'm looking to go into, leaving it at that, right? So your interviewer knows that you've done the research and that you've been thoughtful about why you want to be there. Um, you also want to talk about your goals and how training and, and, and working at this place can help you get there. You're not, there's no place that you're gonna stay at forever. You know, it, this job or opportunity might last a year, it might last two, three, four, five years, but at some point you're gonna go. And so what do you wanna be able to say that you received at this place that prepares you for whatever comes next, whether you can see that next thing or not? Um, so yeah, I think that those are, those are just some of the things that uh, you can do to prep and really shine in an interview. Mm -hmm. I think that selling the match is probably one of the most important things. Uh, Absolutely. Well, actually, no, it's the most important thing. I think that selling the match is the most important part of the interview. So from my own personal experiences, I can say that when I applied to the doctoral program, as an immigrant, I didn't know I had to apply to more than one school and I was lucky to get accepted to the school that I applied to. And I can tell you at the time, I understood that of you know, making sure that I could show that I was a good match for the school. Mm -hmm. Not only for the school, but for the professor I wanted to work with. So I had someone in mind, so she was one of my idols. So I really, really wanted to work with this professor. I felt like I really need to work in and receive her mentorship because mm -hmm. she looks a lot like the person I would like to become in the future. She has the type of experiences that I would like to have in the mm -hmm. future, right? So that's what you want to think about when you're applying for a doctoral program and who are you thinking will be a good mentor for you. Mm -hmm. So what I did was to read a lot about her. So I already knew about her, but I already actually like I put more effort into reading more. So I read multiple books and articles. I read interviews just to get to know her better. And this is really helpful for a number of reasons. First, it's just to confirm the fact that she will be a good match for me by right? right. so personality wise and everything else. And then the other thing, it, it was extremely helpful in terms of knowing that before the interview, because I was able to you know, bring those issues 
during the interview. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I read this book and I really, I was really interesting about the research that you conducted on whatever. The topic. Like, so mm -hmm. That shows that you're really, really interested in this placement and really, really interested in working with that specific person. That shows respect, that shows enthusiasm, that shows that you are probably doing a lot more than most people because most people do not take the time uh, to do that type of um, work. Research, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, early on in the program, so while I, when I became a psychology student, I heard about the importance of matching for internship, a good internship, I think how difficult that process is. Mm -hmm. So, and I was able to identify my dream place very early on, very early on. So that was the place that I wanted to go to, uh, which was Boston University Medical Center, the Center for Multicultural Training in Psychology. I knew that was my dream place, right? So I put a lot of effort into becoming the perfect match for that place. And how do I do that? So I reviewed my CV at the time and I started looking at adding presentations, publications, volunteer experiences, practical experiences that were related to what this site was about, right? So your CV overall should show that you are a good match already. However, that is not enough for your interview. Some people believe that, oh, I already put everything on my CV. I already put everything on my cover letter. So they already know who I am and no. <laughs> the reality is that you cannot assume that they know why you're a good match. Never assume that. Yes. So um, also do not spend an excessive amount of time repeating everything that you already said, but just mm -hmm. summarizing in a good way. It's just like mm -hmm. I did, you know, it's just a summary of your overall experiences and why you would be the perfect match for that site. Mm -hmm. I, yes, I agree with all that. And I even, I tell my students at Fordham that when they are interviewing, because they are interviewing and reviewing so many applications, they might confuse what you've written with what somebody else has written. So that's another reason why it's important not to assume that they remember your stuff, like, you know, like verbatim. Um, so you know, summarizing and paraphrasing what you've already included in your application can help them to remember exactly what you uh, wrote. Because now with the pandemic, we have almost twice the number of applications that we did last year, right? So there are even more applications to review. There are more details to remember. There are more people that you're going to probably need. And so it's, you know, not assuming I think is um, the safest way to go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Another thing that I emphasize with people a lot is just to always, always be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. This is a really fundamental part. So, for example, and this happened to me, I was applying to a dream place, a dream place. And um, I saw that they were looking for people with a specific type of training. It was DVT training, actually, that they were mm -hmm. looking for. Among other skills, it wasn't the only thing, but it was one more that they were really interested in the person uh, having. So um, I didn't have formal training on that. And based on the, um, the date of the interview, I, you know, it was impossible for me to get it before the interview. So mm -hmm. what I did was to order books from Amazon. So I already had some, so I had training, but not the formal one, right? So what I did was just to intensify the training that I had, which was my own, just kind of like on my own reading, reviewing videos mm -hmm. and all of that. And then looking at future trainings that I could take, mm. you know, while already getting, after getting the, the job. So instead of waiting for them to bring this issue up, I brought it up myself by saying, I understand that it will be, a, that one of the skills that you are looking for includes this. And I have to be honest, I didn't complete the formal training, but this is what I did. 
I completed this training, this other one, I read on my own, and this is my plan on how I'm, uh, I'm going to enhance that education. Yes. Right? I'm planning to take this training on this specific day, and I went ahead and did it. I, I fulfilled that you know, promise. So they really like that. They really like that because you're saying a lot by saying that. You're saying that I'm incredibly interested in this site. I took the time to review what your requirements were. I went ahead and did everything I could to make sure I could meet it. And then I have a plan on how to continue doing that. And a lot of things that you can say by the way that you express yourself and, 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 and you know, communicate during the interview. I, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that because I think that that's something that I really want my students um, to think about how they can do for the interview. Like at this point, we're all grown, we're all adults, you know, and if you are interviewing for a position, the person who's interviewing you wants to know that they're not going to have to hold your hand with, you know, with every step of the way that you are going to take the initiative and that you are going to do the research and that if you have a question or a problem that they are not going to be your first line of defense, that you are going to use the skills, the relationships, the connections you already have to do everything in your power to answer that question and solve that problem before you go to them for consultation. So all of the steps and the proactiveness that you can do to say, hey, I've thought about this before. I know this could pop up as a problem. These are the things that I'm willing to do to solve that problem or answer that question, you know, when they emerge so that you never have to worry about it, I think is a really important skill that people at the externship level want, internship level have to have, postdoc are expecting you to have, and everybody else is like, well, you got your, your, you know, your degree, so why aren't you already doing this? Um, and I, I think that these interviews are a great first opportunity to show that you're willing to do that, because if you're not, somebody else will. Somebody else will. Exactly. Yes, mm -hmm. I think that showing initiative is just, it's just a, a fantastic way to, you know, show who you are as a person and who you're going to, how you're going to behave mm -hmm. while already on the job. So tip number six is very specific for clinical psychology or counseling students. Mm -hmm. So it has to do with how you talk about clinical cases. So Dr. Thompson, what, what is it that you recommend? Yes. Um, so before I joined the faculty at Fordham, I was at the Counseling and Wellness Service Center at New York University for two years. And as part of that responsibility, I helped to interview and basically review applications for our externship program and our postdoc program. Now, the postdoctoral fellowship, by that point, those professionals got it. They know how to talk about their cases. They have a, a formula that works for them, but the externs who are younger in the process might not have as much experience with that. And so the more I started interviewing, the more I started asking them, okay, tell me about a case and then having to kind of give them suggestions on, okay, we, what, what about this part? What about that part? So by the time I got to Fordham, and I, and I was literally sending students out to on these externship interviews, I could say, okay, look, this is what I asked for at NYU. I have, I want boom, 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 right? And I'm gonna give you the template, but I'll tell you that I think that whether you use this template or not is completely, like, it's not important. What's important is that you have a template that you, that you feel comfortable with and that you not turn the case into a long drawn out, you know, Game of Thrones, this character had this going on, this character had this, because you never know how much time you have for these interviews. If the interview is 30 minutes, you don't want to spend a full five or 10 minutes conceptualizing a case. You want to give it to them bullet point, boom, 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 so that you allow them to remain in the driver's seat of the interview. And if they have questions about your case, they can ask you, but you don't want to be talking about it for so long that it cuts down on their opportunity to ask you other questions that they also want to know. So these are some things that I think that could benefit you, or this is a template I think that you might use. 
Um, first, you want to start off with the demographics of this case. Age, gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, uh, socioeconomic status. You might not use all of them, but whatever, you know, parts of the case you think are important. You know, I was working with 35 year old Korean American woman, two kids. She worked at a factory. She, you know, she um, you know, shared that her Korean heritage was important to her. However, she was raised in the United States. And she was seven years of age. That gives you everything you need to know about who this person is in a, in a nutshell, right? Um, once you give demographics, you move on to the presenting problem. Like what types of symptoms did they have? Did they present with things related to anxiety, depression, trauma? Might there have been a history of uh, personality disorder or disassociative symptoms? Again, not going all around the mulberry bush, but giving them very, you know, very clear indices of what uh, the, the um, client showed up with. Next, you want to give them a diagnosis if there was one. In many facilities or settings, diagnoses are not used, not provided, and that's fine. But if, if you know, um, you are in a place where diagnoses are provided, you want to share that to help help the interviewer kind of conceptualize the case as you're going. Um, you want to then give them treatment techniques. You might not necessarily have a full blown theoretical orientation yet, but you might use a little bit from CBT, you might use a little bit from psychodynamic, you might use a little bit from humanist uh, techniques. So you want to give the interviewer some idea of what were the approaches that you used with this client. If you are um, interviewing for an externship or an internship, I think it's important to show or to talk about how you collaborated with your supervisor on this case, because up until the point where you are a licensed professional, everything you do is under somebody else's license. So I think it's important that the interviewer knows that you are aware of that and that you were not practicing in a silo, that as a trainee, you were asking for feedback and receiving it and using it. Because until you get to a point where no one is supervising you, that is gonna be a crucial component of your training. So you wanna give a very brief one or two bullet points of how your supervisor helped you with that case. Did they help you conceptualize? Did they make suggestions? Did they help you with diagnosis? Did, were you going to make a choice at some point and the supervisor say, said, mm, don't try that because of this reason, try this instead. I want you to give me some sort of back and forth between your supervisor. I want you to also talk about cultural factors, right? Because it's 2021 and we, you know, cannot afford to ignore them any longer in the in the context of mental health. So, you know, does this person's family or community impact uh, treatment somehow? Is stigma an issue? Um, you know, do they experience discrimination? Do they experience xenophobia? How did those things manifest? in their real lives or in the therapy office with you. And then conclude all of this with treatment outcomes. Often when I'm working with students at Fordham and we're doing interview prep, they'll say, well, can I give a case that I'm working on right now? And I'll be like, mm, I prefer you give me a case that you've worked on in the past so that I can see a full portrait of what your work has been. It, there's, it's not like bad to give me a case that you're working on with right now, but you're not going to be able to give me treatment outcomes. The most you can give me is where you think treatment will go or how treatment looks like it's going right now. But I really want a, a complete, okay, after 10 or 12 months of working with this person, this is where they ended up. These were the things that they're able to do. I saw a 15% decrease in depressive symptoms. I saw a 20% increase in sleep. I saw less fighting, I saw more, you get the point, right? And so when you follow a template like that, you're literally walking the supervisor through the case and you're not reaching for details out in the universe to you know, add this, because this sounds helpful. Like you've thought about, okay, this is what I'm going to say to an interviewer because I expect that they're gonna ask and I'm gonna make sure that I give them this case quickly enough so that after I'm done, I can ask them, do you have any questions? And then they can pick and choose and say, you know, yes, I, I do have a question. Can you tell me more about 
the diagnosis? Or can you tell me more about the cultural factors? Or they may say, nope, you covered all my bases. Thank you for conceptualizing the case. Now I can ask you something else. Because when I was at NYU, when they would conceptualize the case, I would be writing down all of the details that I could catch. Sometimes I'd ask them to repeat them, but usually I could use enough shorthand to where I'm, I'm writing as they're talking. And by the time they're done talking, I have the full case written down. So later on, when my boss asks me, well, how did that applicant do in their interview? I can go back and say, this is the case that they presented to me, all right? And this is what we can, this is the skill set we can expect to get if we accept this person. But then I was also able to ask them other things too, right? I don't wanna be able to just give them that case. Um, so, so hopefully, you know, using a template that works for you um, can work in, in making sure that the interview goes smoothly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. In terms of treatment outcomes, I also like to hear um, things such as um, they were, they successfully got a new job, they got mm -hmm. a promotion, they got, you know, some specific Concrete. type of results that are outside yep. of the general um, a psychological assessments. Yeah, that, that works nicely. Um, I also like the cultural factors to be integrated. That is a, a really difficult thing to find. Most people don't do that. But when I see anybody doing that, it, I'm very impressed. So like, it's just the person who is able from the very beginning, mm -hmm. if they're talking about cultural factors and integrate it all along the way. So for example, it could be this patient was born, whatever, uh, during a, so it could be uh, this patient was born in Africa, in a specific country in Africa, where, and at the time there was a work going on that, mm -hmm. you know, increased their stress and led them to develop PTSD as a child. And, you know, it's just like mm -hmm. moving on and just showing how different aspects of their development that have to do with their environment yes. and their country of origin and community impacted them. Absolutely. And what steps do you take to address that during therapy? If you consulted anybody, um, what extra materials you read to make sure that you were competent to take that case? Mm -hmm. if there was any safety issues that you had to address and how you address them. Mm -hmm. And then it would be just like, yeah, termination. So how yeah. do you, you terminate the case? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And and it, I'm glad you brought up the issue of safety too, because at, um, at NYU, the level of psychopathology is really intense. And one of the things that we tend to ask, you know, our applicants is if you have a client who has suicidal ideation or non-suicidal self-injury or signs of an eating disorder, what types of steps do you take to mitigate that risk? I want to hear out of the applicant's mouth at some point, I conducted a safety plan. Like, I want to hear those words and I want to hear what goes into that safety plan based on the risk, you know? I also really like what you just said about doing the readings um, and showing what you did to prepare for that case. Because just because a supervisor gives you a case does not necessarily mean that you are already prepared to take it. And one of the things that I really liked about our internship program was them, I remember them teaching us about the idea of a cultural consultant. Do you remember that? Yeah. About how, you know, sometimes if you get a case and they are from a cultural background that you're not really familiar with or you've never worked with in the past, you need to contact a professional in our field who has had work with that work with that client and ask them questions to inform yourself so that they can be like a sounding board. You don't give this cultural consultant you know you don't you don't identify the patient you don't give them their real name or anything about them that they can really take and say i know who this person is but you want to be able to say look i have a you know a 17 year old you know guatemalan female and she's been dealing with you know these issues this happened in her country so do you know anybody who has done 
research on Guatemalan populations? Or do you know a Guatemalan psychologist? Or do you know someone who has been to that country before? That, you know, these are all examples, but not an exhaustive list of somebody who could be a cultural consultant for that um, for that client. And then when you are conceptualizing the case, like when I talked about consulting with a supervisor, you you let the interviewer know, you know, for this case, I, you know, sought out cultural consultation because I knew that I needed more in my skill set or my knowledge base to be able to help them. And I think that that shows um, not only humility, but also initiative and also thinking about what you can do to be the most multicultural professional possible like taking those extra steps steps i think can be really important absolutely yeah a common question also that may come up during an interview is like how do you deal with challenges so that's another opportunity to bring up your clinical skills as well so an example that i give was that when I was a practicum student, I was placed at a juvenile detention center. Mm -hmm. And I had a really hard time connecting with the girls there at the beginning. And it was, I was devastated because I was really enthusiastic about going there. I had a lot of hope that things were going to be go well. And then I follow what I was told to do. I, I did what I was told to do, which was you know, go there and then use psychoeducational materials. So it's like kind of like read that to them and engage them in the best way I could. And that didn't work <laughs> at all. I mean, I felt like very rejected by the girls. I felt like they didn't want me there. They didn't like me, all of that. So um, that was pretty devastating. So what I did personally, and I recommend others to do is to first, you know, take a deep breath. If you're too emotional that day, it's just like maybe take a day off, like go to bed, you know, try to see things um, in a new light the next morning and do your best to seek out um, new information that can help you understand the situation better. So what I did was just like started reading a lot about what works with girls in juvenile detention centers. So that's how I found that art was a really good way to engage girls in juvenile detention centers. So um, I looked at a professor in the faculty who actually had served as the president of the American Art Therapy Association. So I was really lucky. <laughs> I was really lucky to find her. And, and so I reached out to her and told her the situation and sought out her uh, guidance. So she was extremely helpful. She also happened to be from Argentina, where I'm from. So it was oh, wow. a pretty match in terms of a new mentor for me. You lucked out. And yeah, and it worked out really well. So I learned a lot about using art therapy. I'm not an art therapist, but I learned how to incorporate art. Right. Therapy. So, I started doing that and at the beginning the girls you know i was able to engage one and then the other ones were like mm, whatever you know she's like not really too cool attention. for school yeah mm -hmm. but eventually because they saw that you know this girl was having fun like they started to come in and like just uh, getting and get engaged in the activities and then more and more she's kind of like this group um, started having like a lot of fun just doing art so coloring and drawing and painting and acting and even singing which i don't do but so the girls girls in the general detention center plus some of the guards who work there even sang once so, so so we cover many different ways um to do art there and it was a, a really great experience so by by sharing that experience, what I'm sharing is like, I faced a, a tremendous challenge and I took the initiative again to seek out information and to increase my competence in that area. And then I saw how it worked, it worked well and moved on, right? So, so that's just, it's really important. And this is like a skill that you wanna have for any kind of job really. So generally, when you face a challenge, when you face a problem, you want to really spend time to figuring out how to best resolve it. And even if you decide, so I will do that 
sometimes there are cases where I, I found ways to resolve it and I go on to do that. And then I tell my supervisor after the fact. There are some cases where, where it's a serious issue, like you're facing like safety concerns regarding a patient. You must inform your supervisor, right? But it's still, it is a good idea to do to do to think about potential solutions and then share those potential solutions with the supervisor. So you're not just coming with a problem, you are coming with a problem, potential solutions, and you're seeking out uh, more uh, help, more guidance in that regard. So that's another way to share a challenge and do an interview. Yeah. Okay. So tip number seven, we want to address, so what if you have not had therapy clients yet? So for people who are applying to uh, doctor pro uh, programs. Uh, so doctoral programs, externships, um, it's a lot, you know, a lot of people out there who want to be in psychology who've never, who haven't had a chance to practice it yet. And I would say you are still qualified and eligible for this opportunity because again, they invited you for an interview, right? That you wouldn't be there if they looked at your materials and thought you couldn't do it. So if you haven't actually worked with a client yet, here are a couple of things that you might consider do, doing. Um, first, talk about the rigorous classes that you've had, right? You can literally bring up, well, this is what I learned in psychopathology class. My professor had us you know, write these kinds of papers, do these kinds of role plays um, to demonstrate that your skill sets can map, can map onto actual intervention. Talking about places that you have volunteered, right? The types of opportunities that you sought out. Um, have you worked at a homeless shelter before? Have you worked at a women's shelter before? Have you mentored kids that are at risk or not? Have you, um, you know, done um, environmental policy work or policy work in general? Have you done research? What topics did you do research on? What did you look for? What did you find? What does it mean, right? Helping the interviewer to imagine how the experiences you have already had will map onto what they're going to ask you to do. Talk about your passion for the field. How long have you wanted to be a counselor or a psychologist? I don't mean tell them what happened when you were five. I mean, tell them I have wanted this since I was five. And these are the things that I've done to get myself prepared for it. And, and being in your training opportunity is the next logical step towards a, a career that I've been dreaming about since I was yay high. And then familiarize yourself with any cases that you may have read about and conceptualize them. So I'll never forget about a girl who had been locked in a garage by her father and the father had like abused her, you know, and, uh, and she ended up um, being extremely developmentally like delayed because she had never been held. She had never been, you know, nurtured. And so the case was more about when she finally was extracted from that horrible environment, all of the love and care that you know, clinicians and social workers put into getting her, you know, ready for the world. And unfortunately, the abuse that she experienced prevented her from ever really, you know, being, um, reaching all of her milestones. But what is important is you're remembering cases. You're, you're able to say, I, I, I can see how a case can go from, you know, typical human behavior to abnormal behavior. And these are the factors that I'm aware of. These are the risk factors. These are the associated fe features supporting a diagnosis. These are the things that you're likely to see. And so even if you haven't actually had a client yet, if you're, like you said, Dr. Espinola, taking the initiative to do readings and to learn about case studies, you can demonstrate that you have an idea of how the process works. So those are some things I think that you can do if you haven't had any clinical cases yet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, I agree with that. What I would add also that I feel is a good type of experience to have is a volunteer work that require you to be face to face with people and provide some type of service. Like it could be, so it could be working at the soup kitchen, at the food bank. I personally really like uh, to see that people have worked 
for a better women's shelter or for LGBTQ youth um, mm -hmm. who are homeless, for instance, um, foster youth. So those type of experiences tell me that you have an interest in multicultural issues, you have an interest in trauma, that you have some type of exposure mm -hmm. to the populations I usually uh, take care of. So that for me is a good a good sign. Yeah. I also like to see that you're building up your professional identity mm. as a counselor or a psychologist or a medical student. And I like to see that by, so I think one way to show it is that you are already a member of a professional organization. So the American Psychological Association, the, the Psychological Association of your state, mm -hmm. um, the Medical Association. So that shows me that you're, you're already seeing yes. yourself as a professional in training. Mm -hmm. And then that you have already attended conferences or you have given presentations related to the field all of that is you can use to show you that you're really interested in that uh, you're building up your career tip number eight has to do with the questions that you will have for them for the people who are interviewing you so dr thompson what can you tell us about that expect for them to ask you what questions do you have for them? They are evaluating you on those questions, just like they are evaluating you on the answers you have for their questions. If you don't have questions for them, what it suggests is that you're not as enthusiastic about this as they, you know, that as you could be. So even if you have standard boilerplate questions that you use for everybody, don't go to nobody's interview without having some questions for them. Um, here are some standard boilerplate questions that you can ask anybody. First, what are some traits that your ideal extern, intern, postdoc employee would possess? Like, what are you all looking for, right? I know what you, I know what you offer, I know what you do, but what do you want in somebody who uh, would, would get an, a, a position like this? That's one question. Another question are, is, what have some of your previous externs, interns, postdocs, employees gone on to do after this opportunity? How have you all um, you know, supported them in their professional development? Um, what you don't want to do, and I know some people do, and I, full respect, but I wouldn't try that tack, is to ask anything that's controversial, right? If, if they popped up in the news for something or if somebody that worked for them popped up in the news, you're not bringing that up. You know, you're just not. It, it, there's just no, you wait until you get in the building, until you ask things that are somewhat controversial. The questions you ask them need to illustrate your enthusiasm for them. And it needs to demonstrate you've already done research on them. But there is just one thing I didn't notice on your website. And I've been wondering about it since I started doing research. Can you tell me more about that? Right. That is going to help them to see, wow, this person really, you know, has been thinking about us and wants to be working with us. Um, that this by no means is an exhaustive list of things you can ask. And I think that the more research that you have done on a site, the more nuanced your questions become for them. And I hope that you will give them at least one nuanced question. Um, but make sure that whether they ask you that question or not, that you have something ready for them. I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah, what I would add to this would be just to make sure that you don't ask questions that are already answered on the website. Do, if you already have the, the materials and the materials are telling you specific information, just follow that. Um, yeah, do not do not ask uh, questions that are mentioned either in the website or the program materials or have already been addressed that day. And you can avoid that by paying attention and just make sure that you're not getting distracted by anything. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And it, I'm so glad you said that. And, you know, the, um, and the way to avoid that is just being very mindful 
while you're doing your research and being mindful while you're in the interview process and really listening to what they say, what other people say, what has been written down. Um, and, you know, if all else fails, if you're in doubt, then don't say anything at all. You know, just ask a boilerplate question and bring it right back to, and this is why I think I'm a good fit for this site. You know, I, I would rather, you know, a student bring it back to why they are a good fit for the site than to ask a question that's kind of like coming from left field and makes the interviewer be like, why did we invite this person for an interview? Because it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think that, um, you know, being very careful about about what you ask and making sure that everything that you say and ask is in the service of demonstrating why you're a good fit for their program. Exactly. Yeah, that's great advice for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Notes. OK, um, in New York City, when students are applying for externships, they are specifically forbidden from sending thank you notes. So it's really important to know if there are any rules um, preventing that, right? At the extern level, do not send thank you emails, notes, anything. Just make sure you leave a really positive impression and um, you know, let them know that you look forward to um, you know, hearing from them in the future. And that's it. And if you never see them again until next year, that's fine, right? At the internship level, however, and, and postdoc level as well, it is perfectly acceptable to send thank you notes. Um, and I remember when I was going through internship, I would buy thank you notes by the stack. And as soon as I was done with the interview, like later that day, I would immediately start writing out the thank you note and putting it in the mail as soon as possible. Because what you wanna do is make sure that they can see your thank you note soon after meeting with you so that you, like they can add that to your file and you're less likely to be forgotten. Um, thank you notes, you, you know, you can say pretty much anything you want. This is what I tended to do. I would, you know, thank them. Like the first statement is, thank you so much for inviting me for the interview and taking time to speak with me. I genuinely appreciated my time there. Um, you know, now that I've seen it, I'm even more enthusiastic about the opportunity. Um, I, you know, hope that good things happen in the future or whatever type of like ending statement. It doesn't have to be specific to that. If you want to be uh, like special or unique, you might add one small detail that occurred in the course of the interview, like a, a joke that was made or a connection that was made that helps them to really remember who you are, right? If Especially if you evoked emotion or they evoked emotion from you, you might include that. But to be on the safe side, just stick with the general boilerplate stuff. If you feel like adding that additional detail is not going to be too much, sure. But a thank you note shouldn't be any longer than a regular, like the, the size of a thank you note. This is not a thank you letter. This is not a thank you publication. This is a thank you note. So making sure that all of your thank you notes are standard across the board, that you're thanking them for their time, that you're re-emphasizing why you're a good fit and that you're wishing them well moving forward. If you just cover those three points, you're good. Um, with the pandemic, I think that an email is probably safer than sending an actual note because it's going to exchange so many hands and we also know that you know right now unfortunately the united states postal service is a little bit more stressed out than they have been in the past so if you want them to get the thank you note quickly and safely then sending an email will be really will be helpful but again um if it's you know if if they're not if they're not if they're telling you they don't want thank you notes at all it's really important that you follow that procedure and not do it um, unless there's no law saying you shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, my preference would be email. Um, yeah, it can be an opportunity to show that you're a good match in a very, very concise way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can also add if you had uh if the person who interviewed you said that they didn't read your cv or they didn't see your cover art you may want to attach it as well mm -hmm. oh that's a good idea yeah anything that yeah that generally i think it's, it's a good idea just 
you know, it's just one way for them to like easily access your mm -hmm. material sites. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think that the email is probably the superior way to go anyways, because you can include those attachments. But I remember, again, when we were applying for internship, um, I remember that I had wrote all my thank you notes out. And then when it came time for the training director, because I was so anxious, I kept like my handwriting would get really sloppy writing out his name, you know, like the E came out wrong or the D came out wrong. And I would immediately just trash the whole thing and start all over again. You don't have that issue with the email, right. you know, you know, but I mean, it was so like, I have to have an internship, like this thank you note, I've got to stick this landing and you get to the very end, and you know, there's like a heavy ink blot where there should be a period and it, now it's ugly and you can't use it. But yes, email I think is a really good way to go. And you know, for a postdoc, you know, internship, regular job and interviews, you know, I think emails are completely uh, acceptable, but at the externship level, um, it's not for whatever reason, the, the, the externship gods in New York City have said, no, that might be different in other places in the country. Um, but if you are watching this and you are a Fordham student or you just happen to be a New York City student, just keep in mind that NinjaDot, uh, which is the um, New York, New Jersey Association of uh, Directors of Training, have said have forbidden thank you notes. So be, be mindful of that law. Okay, great. <laughs> oh my God. Well, so thank you so much for joining me today. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, honestly, I, I hope that if this, you know, if this video can help at least one person to be a little bit more um, comfortable and confident um, for the interview, then, you know, then this has been really time well spent. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to um, share some of these tips, because if somebody has shared this with me 10 years ago, I imagine things might have gotten a, gone a little bit easier for me. <laughs>